So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking briefly with us on a very important subject uh, that's very relevant to our practice in Africa and, of course, to you here too. And what I'm talking about is sharing skills and development of research capacity in Africa. I've been introduced, so I won't uh, belabor you with uh, further information. Uh, this slide shows Africa the background, where we have various clinical research human resources at various stages and various levels of knowledge and skills in clinical research scattered all over Africa. And uh, here we have the clinical research team in developed countries uh, trying to see how they can partner with those resources scattered all over Africa. And uh, the model that has been found to be useful is for the team here to share their skill and knowledge through training with those resources that are scattered all over Africa. And if that is achieved, it is like a seed sown in a fertile ground, which ultimately we bought and produce great fruits that will solve the problem that are related to health in developing country. And uh, to look at this topic, I want to consider this outline. We want to look at the need for research and the gaps in capacity in Africa also the building research capacity through collaboration, and I'm going to be sharing the experience that we have with the global network. I want to look at the opportunities and also the potentials that are available across Africa, and how we can sustain the global network in Africa. There's no doubt that there is a great need for research and the gaps that exist currently need to be bridged. As you look at Africa, Africa constitutes about one over seven of the world population, which is about 730 million in 40 different countries. And the population growth annually is about 2.5%, meaning it's a continent that is growing rapidly. Nigeria happens to be the most populous country in Africa and uh, the most populous black nation in the world with a population of 170 million. Now, what are the problems? 62% of Africans currently live in the slum and the traditional modern lifestyle hazards interacts in a way that is very challenging to the people of Africa. There is a drop in the life expectancy in Africa and the disease burden ratio is also very high. There are places in the world where life expectancy is 80 years and above, but in Africa it's about 53 meaning then that 15 fewer years of life are lost in Africa compared to the global average. So this is a big problem. Even though various countries in Africa have some policies on research, but you will see that there are still some gaps there. These are countries that have health research policies. Uh, but you can see these very large countries of Africa that do not have uh, such policies you know, on ground. Apart from that, not all the countries have strategic plans on health research, as you can see in the, uh, the diagram there. Uh, some of the countries in North Africa, in Central Africa and uh, Southern part of Africa uh, do not have. But 
we do have some countries that have that already established. Also, health research programs are not uniform across Africa. We have some countries that have uh, health research programs going on, but again, we have some gaps where nothing really uh, seems to be going on or nothing documented seems to be going on. As per laws guiding research, uh, again, not all the countries have that. You can see the countries in red do not have, uh, but the countries in green do have. So what we're trying to say here is uh, those gaps exist currently. And if you look at the amount of money, government funding, that goes into research in Africa, again, you will see diversity. Uh, WHO recommends that at least 15% of the GDP should go into health uh, generally, and of course some of that into health research. But as you look at the total health expenditure, uh, that is research, service delivery, training, and everything that has to do with uh, health expenditure across Africa, you will see that uh, it's very low, uh, about less than 2.5% in some countries and uh, between 25 to 5% in some countries. Only very few countries have above 5% of their GDP you know, used for health expenditure as opposed to the 15% that World Health Organization recommends. Uh, in spite of this gap that exists, you will see that the amount of clinical research and clinical research development going on in Africa, it's far cry from the burden of diseases that we have just talked about. Uh, you look at, for instance, uh, Europe, you will see the number of, uh, the distribution of registered clinical trials going on uh, 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 there in, 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 in Europe. You see Africa, just about 701, compared to more than 2,000 going on in Europe, and uh, more than 7,000 cumulatively going on in northern part of Africa. Even the southern part of America, sorry, even the southern part of America seems to have more clinical research registered uh, in those uh, areas, meaning then that despite the large gap in clinical research and clinical research development, uh, the amount of work going on is still very, very low. Uh, it means if nothing is done, that gap will only continue to widen with time. So that is why uh, the need for uh, developing capacities in Africa becomes very, very important. How can this be done? Research building capacity or building research capacity through collaboration. I'll just share with you some of the things we've done in the past seven years and the, the effect of that, the impact of that, and uh, how we can still leverage on that to even further narrow the gap that exists. While we talk of research capacity strengthening, uh, we're talking about any effort whatsoever that ultimately improve the ability of individuals and institutions to undertake high quality research and to engage with the wider community of uh, research stakeholders. Uh, the purpose of research capacity strengthening is one, you identify the gaps in the knowledge and the skills in clinical research development and uh, you strengthen the resources that are available in such a way that we now have people that can do high quality, high quality meaning of equal standard to any research done anywhere in the world, but in the local context, meaning that the research they'll be doing are things that are relevant to solving uh, the health related problems in their own environment. And this also done by local resources, uh, not necessarily some expatriate coming to do the study for them. And the outcome of their results is to make sure they solve the problems that are related to health in their local context. So that is what we mean and uh, by uh, building or strengthening capacity and also encouraging them to continue to engage 
with the wider community of research uh, stakeholders. Seven principles have been found to be of good practice as per capacity strengthening, and WHO published that. Number one, uh, there should be networking, collaboration, and communication. Without networking and collaboration, it will be very difficult to share. Uh, the information may be there, but it's not communicated in a way that the other people can understand and also leverage on. There should be understanding of the local context and also accurately evaluate existing research capacity. Uh, the problem that has happened in the past is trying to enforce things that are not relevant to the local community into them. So programs come that has a different motive, not really to meet the need of the local community, but to generate data for the advanced countries uh, on some of the products perhaps that they may want to develop. And at the end of all those projects and programs, uh, what has been found may not really be relevant to the local context. So in research capacity development, uh, you have to start not from what you want to achieve, but the problem that needs to be solved in the local community. So you want to understand the local context and also accurately evaluate. Uh, there are some existing research capacities and one needs to understand those existing capacities and what the gaps are and how to now uh, build on what is there already. And of course, ensure local ownership and secure active support. This is very important because without local ownership, there is not going to be sustainability. Once the partners leave the program, you discover that the program dies, despite all the amount of money that might have been invested in that program. So from the very beginning, it's very important to ensure that the local uh, facilitators take ownership and then there should be active support. There should be building uh, of, of mentorship and also monitoring and evaluation <coughs> and learning into the plan. Uh, without monitoring and e evaluation, it's going to be very difficult to know the impacts and monitoring and evaluation also help for flexibility and adaptability to know better way of doing it, learning from uh, what is going on in the field. But without uh, a good structure to monitor and evaluate what is happening, it will be very difficult to know how to adjust as per the model that's being used for uh, capacity development. There should be robust research governance and support structure and promotion of effective leadership. It's not enough to just share skills and knowledge, but one needs to look at the institution, the environment where those knowledge and skills will be used. Imagine training researchers and uh, they do not have institutional capacity, for example, to review proposals. The institutional review board may not know exactly what to do with proposals. So you've trained people, but the environment, the context, the institution in which they need to work has not been empowered uh, or have that governance to help them function. So at the end of the day, they are strengthened, they are empowered, but they may not be able to deliver. So from the beginning, you want to strengthen uh, that research governance and uh, make sure there is support structure and promote effective leadership. Also, there should be embedded strong support, supervision and uh, mentorship structure. Uh, it's very important that those that are championing the cause in the local environment are well supervised and mentored because a learning itself is a continuum. So they have to be continually mentored and supervised to improve the quality of the training and the capacity building activities that they are developing over in their countries. And there should be a long-term uh, plan for continuity. It's not enough to start a project and uh, for the project only to die after some time or for the local community not to know how to continue with that program after such partners are no longer running with that program. Uh, from the beginning, a structure must be built such that even without the partners actively participating in the future, and the local community already know what to do to sustain you know, what is being done. And all that has to be built in from the very beginning. I'll just share with us some of the things we've uh, done in Nigeria. Uh, how did we start? 
the Nigerian Regional Faculty started sometimes in 2011, and uh, that was when Trudy, uh, Trudy Lang and myself met in a WHO TDR uh, program in Geneva, and it was just over tea we uh, were discussing, and she muted the need uh, to have capacity development workshop in Africa. And after my own program, fellowship program with TDR, I continued with that vision, and we had the first free uh, global health trial network organized uh, free workshop to build capacity of clinical researchers in 2012. We were able to gather together various uh, levels and roles of clinical researchers, uh, primary principal investigators, sub-investigators, uh, research coordinators, research clinical monitors, uh, clinical research assistants, research nurses and pharmacists, and research lab scientists. We gathered all of them from all over the country, and then we began to uh, tell them the need to form a strong national team uh, that we can use as a base to actually train people to improve in their capacity and to perform better research. So we've done about four of that uh, since that time. So that was the beginning of uh, Global Trial Network in Nigeria. Uh, four regional, between 2012 and 2017, we've been able to form a faculty uh, so we have a structure that's responsible for this research capacity building in Nigeria. So we have a faculty, we call it the Nigerian Regional Faculty of the Global Ed, uh, Network. We've also had four regional research capacity building workshop. Uh, we have weekly blended research training seminars. Uh, the weekly blended research training seminars actually make use of resources available on the Global Ed Trial platform. Uh, it's a platform that has very robust and uh, relevant resources uh, having to do with e-learning. There are short courses, modular courses, and e-learning seminars, uh, uh, video seminars that uh, researchers can actually uh, watch or read and then interact and deliberate and see how it can work in their context. And uh, it's so good that at the end of the day, they have opportunity to do some quizzes that test their knowledge and skills and they're able to get certification, which serves as a sort of reward uh, for their labor. And for those who are not able to get up to that 80% mark, uh, it challenges them to know that their knowledge and skill is not up to what is expected. So they repeat that until they're able to pass. And that serves as a reward to tell them that, yes, I'm better in the knowledge that I have before doing, doing it. So that we've been doing, and uh, we bring all the various roles in clinical research uh, together on a weekly basis uh, using those uh, resources. Also, we've been able to develop a website, uh, the Nigerian Regional Faculty website, which is domained in the Global Health uh, Network webpage. Uh, that's it's a repository of all the things we do in Nigeria, such that even those that do not attend the workshop or the blended program can access the information on what we're doing and that generates interest and make other people to want to know more about what we do. Uh, also, we've been able to induct 20 researchers as professional faculty members. These are people that have participated in what we call the professional membership scheme and they become associate uh, fellows of the Global Health Trial Network. And, uh, after some interview, and we see that they have enough commitment to carry forward what we're doing in the various institutions where they are, we induct them to become a part of faculty members. The first induction actually happened uh, January this year when we had uh, one of those <coughs> workshops. Also, it has attracted several hundreds of interested Nigerians uh, on the Global Health Network platform. When we started, we were just few. But now we have several thousands of Nigerians that have signed up to the uh, Global Trial uh, Network platform. Also, we're able to organize basic statistic workshop. Uh, we discovered during the blended program from the feedback that we're getting from participants that one of the gaps that needed to be filled was uh, knowledge on basic statistics. So based on that feedback, we organized uh, the workshop, which was just about five to six days ago before I came to Oxford. 
and uh, that attracted 61 researchers. Also, we've developed four-year strategic plan because we're looking forward and what really do we want to achieve in the next four years. So we're able to put all that together. So these are some of the things we've been doing. I'll just show a short video. Uh, we may not have time to look at everything. Just for us to see uh, for ourselves some of the things that we've been able to put together. Uh, uh, this is the Minister of uh, Environment in Nigeria who was part of the program because we believe if we're able to get the policy and decision makers in the country to see what we're doing, we're likely to get support uh, from the government. So we invited the minister. And also the other person is the director general uh, of the emergency response in Nigeria uh, because what we're talking about was clinical development of uh, capacity in clinical research in disaster and emergency response. And this is an uh, ambassador from Rwanda uh, because they have actually had a lot of disaster to come and share their experience with us uh, from Rwanda. And here is one of the presidents of the uh, big society of uh, physicians in Nigeria representing the body of physicians. And here we have the participants in the program uh, during that particular workshop. Also, we were able to bring together the media houses, uh, the print media, electronic media. Uh, at least you can see the interview here so that they will know and tell the whole world what's going on. And uh, the day after the program, the television and the newspapers everywhere just carried what was going. So that again is to increase the awareness so that people will know that this is something they can key into and live. So that particular workshop, which took place in January, was oversubscribed. We had more than 250 participants across the country, researchers, but we had only space for uh, 150. So that was why we didn't take more than that. Uh, these are some of the pictures in the program uh, that we took, just for documentation. These are the faculty members uh, in Nigeria. And then, all right. still some of the pictures. Because it was a whole day program, we had to provide uh, something to keep spirit, soul, and body together during the program. All right. Apart from that, I told you we also do blended program. This is a weekly program uh, that brings together researchers in various roles of clinical research uh, with the aim of continuing uh, development of their capacity. We do this in an interactive and deliberative way uh, using the materials on the Global Health uh, Network platform. So we come together and uh, before the week we announce the topic we're going to be treating. Uh, the participants go and on their own uh, study ahead of time and then we appoint somebody that will be like lead discussants or sometimes two or three people that will be the team of lead discussants and then we come and interact and share on uh, the materials that have been studied and then at the end of the day if there are areas that are not clear or further questions I try to coordinate all that you know so it's something that's very flexible sometimes we have the nurses leading sometimes we have the pharmacist leading or the laboratory scientists or the doctors so we make it in such a way that everybody have equal opportunity to interact and participate. And that has actually removed barriers and it has made the team to be strong and uh, it's been growing uh, by the month. Uh, so here we see some of the pictures. You can see media trying to facilitate one of those meetings. And then here we have the scientists, the laboratory scientists, also facilitating one of the meetings. And then we have uh, one of the laboratory scientists uh, training uh, researchers on how to stain slides for malaria and how to see malaria parasites on the microscope. Uh, we also had uh, the workshop on basic statistics. Uh, that again, to my surprise, we had a lot of people. It was a Friday, Saturday program and we had about 61 participants you know, in that program too. 
Now, there are other groups that try to build or strengthen capacity in Nigeria, apart from the global health trial. I just think I should inform you, like the Association of Good Clinical Practice, they conduct like a biennial uh, summit on clinical trial. Uh, we have the National Implementation Science Alliance. They conduct annual training or meeting uh, on clinical research. We have the Institute of Public Health that conduct biennial training on monitoring and evaluation. And then we have the Annual Bioethics Forum uh, for researchers. So all these are other ways by which we try to build capacity. Now, what is the impact of the Nigerian faculty, either two? I would say that it's a very young faculty, but it's growing very, very fast. Very, very fast. Uh, it has created a platform for clinical researchers around the country to meet and discuss research plans, irrespective of area of interest. So it's created like that melting point for everyone across the country uh, to bring up their own ideas, to share their challenges, and then to get support so that they can do better research in the institution across the country. I think it has also fostered that sense of team spirit and unity among uh, researchers across the country. And uh, with increasing family members, key building capacity have actually extended to other parts of the country. Uh, when we started in Abuja, we discovered that with time, other states also you know, started leveraging on what we're doing. And other institutions within Abuja too, when they see what we do, they go to their own institution and try to replicate the same thing, still using the global trial uh, network. There are great opportunities and potentials. Uh, we have large pool of personnel with basic research skills, fast growing. We have large disease burden, communicable and non-communicable, meaning that the opportunity to do clinical research is very, very high. And then we have the national network of research team that conduct multi-center studies and can also respond to national emergencies. Our immediate next steps, we're planning for the 2018 International Conference. Hopefully, this is going to be the first international conference, uh, hopefully, by the Nigerian Regional Faculty of the Global Air Trial Network. And uh, hopefully, it's going to attract other uh, members of the uh, global family around the world, and uh, even from Oxford there. And, uh, expand the capacity building sites around Nigeria and promoting the use of the Global Trial Network online resources. So many people are now visiting the sites. Uh, just recently, I saw that the Global Trial Network has hit uh, one million uh, people that have visited the site. And if you go and look at it, you see that Nigeria is uh, one of those that have contributed uh, largely to that one million. You know, Mark. <clears throat> How do we sustain the global network activities in Africa? This is very important. It's not just good to start something. You want to make sure what you are doing is sustainable. Even when you have other programs that are now taking your attention and you are not focusing mainly on that particular project at that time, uh, that project should be able to sustain itself. Uh, what are the things that will help? Uh, the program, the project, should be sustained in Africa. The first thing I would say is uh, we need to understand the local context and accurately evaluate existing research capacity. Without understanding the local context, it becomes very, very difficult you know, to sustain uh, the work there because you might now not be on the same page. And because of that, you will not be able to sustain what you're doing. So the capacity strengthening must be relevant to the local context. The question is, not what do I want to do. The question is, what do they need? And if we work from there, you can now marry what is needed in the field with what you want to do and come to a, a balance. And then from there, uh, you'll be able to sustain what is being done. It's good to, uh, for the program to be driven by local facilitators. Uh, and also, the goal must be to empower the local researchers, not just to learn but to conduct clinical research. Uh, what I've noticed is that a time come when there's like more or less a burnout syndrome. People keep learning and learning and learning and learning. And they will ask, why am I learning all this? 
What am I supposed to be doing with all these skills and knowledge? So if the opportunity is not given for them to apply the knowledge and the skill to solve real life, real world, health related problem in their local context, after some time the program will just die. You know, because they will feel, why am I getting all the power if I'm not going to use it? So that is a very, very important thing that needs to be considered. Uh, also, there must be robust research governance and support structure and effective leadership is important. Actually, without good leadership, it will be very difficult to sustain because there are going to be a lot of barriers, hindrances, and it takes a lot of leadership to institutionalize the global health program in the various region. If it's only anchored on individual, it will be very, very difficult to sustain. So the goal should be the individual should have enough leadership skill, project management skill, to embed the global health program in the institutional activity, such that with the absence of that particular facilitator over time, or with the movement of that person to another location, the program continues there. And that's what we have tried to do in our own institution, such that even though I'm here, uh, the program is still going on over there because they know what to do, they know how to do it, and the institution is in full support of it. So that institutionalization is very, very important for sustainability. And that means that the support structure of that institution has to be built up. For example, the higher B uh, has to be strengthened so that they will know exactly uh, what to do. And uh, there should be, okay, a responsive capacity strengthening activity should support institutions and individuals to meet uh, those needs. Training in project management and leadership uh, for those that are facilitating the program, it's also very important if uh, the program is to be sustained. There must be monitoring and evaluation built into the program from the very beginning because that's the only way you can measure the impact. And it's when you see the impact and you also get the feedback that you know how to develop and improve on what you are doing. So we want to ask yourself, are researchers, the researches that are being done, are they relevant to the local environment? And uh, if not, how can we help them to conduct researches that are relevant to their own local environment? Strong support, supervision, and mentorship has to be embedded uh, in the program from the beginning. Uh, it's very important that uh, facilitators in the local environment has to be mentored. For example, one of the important factors in sustaining any project is the funding. If you are not able to get funding, you aren't going to do anything. So how do you get the funding? It's not enough for those supporting or building or strengthening capacity to know how to get the funding and provide funding. Because one day, uh, their funding will have to go into other things and not that particular project. So how do we empower, mentor the local facilities to know how to source for funding or grants, to know how to write you know, for grants, to know how to even manage the grants itself. Because if you don't know how to manage grants very well, you are not likely to get another one. You know, so all this mentorship has to be put in place to be able to sustain uh, the program. And of course, we have to think long term. We have to be very flexible and plan for continuity. In conclusion, I will say that clinical research capacity strengthening is inevitable. And if the gaps in clinical research knowledge and skills must be bridged, all stakeholders should collaborate to bridge the gap and provide solutions to the real life health related problems in our society. I will say thank you very much for your attention. And these are some of my references. Thank you.